Our policy makers finally changing their tune. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Thursday, December 1st, 2022. I'm Wes Nakamura, and I'm joined today by Daniel Lacau from, uh, she's a chief economist uh, at Tresses. Uh, just before we get started, just a quick reminder, live chat function uh, on the Real Vision site, temporarily down. So please just drop your questions in the comment section of the Real Vision website um, in the live chat uh, on YouTube, or just tweet us um, at our Twitter handle, uh, Real Vision. And on a separate programming note, we will be taking a look at individual single stocks on Monday. So please drop comments with some stock names and tickers that we should take a look at uh, to respond to you on Monday. So Dan, welcome back to Real Vision. How are you, sir? Very well. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, yes, pleasure is all mine. Um, I, I do feel kind of awkward sitting here right now uh, as you're in Spain, I'm in Japan and we're coming off of a World Cup in which Japan has just uh, uh, upset uh, <laughs> what should have been uh, the better team. Um, but, uh, but I'm not going to mention the World Cup. <laughs> I, think that, uh, I, I think that these the two people in this chat are not very interested in soccer. Exactly. And, uh, I'm American. You know, very, very, very <laughs> is due. The one who won is, was the best. That's That's absolutely clear. Right, right. I, I keep forgetting that I'm, I'm actually American, and therefore, I, I, you know, I don't care about soccer. So, um, but, I'll, you know, looking at markets today, right? So, yeah, so U.S. equities, I mean, ending more or less flat. We did see the VIX drop below, uh, you know, the 20 handle into print 19 for a, for a moment. Um, this is coming off of a sizable rally that we had yesterday. Uh, we do have, uh, however, some pretty significant moves in uh, the bond space and the currency space, and therefore, especially in the commodity space. I'm um, looking at gold up about three and a quarter percent. Um, we had silver up, you know, five and a half percent, uh, copper about a percent and a half, um, and, and so on. So um, I guess just broadly speaking, what do you make of this um, this price action uh, with regards to the, I guess, the broader dollar uh, and its impact on commodities? Well, I think that we've had first uh, a big risk on move after the uh, inflation print of the United States came relatively better than what market expected, not that the inflation print was any good. No? So what I think is happening is that uh, people are starting to look at bellwethers of uh, what uh, consensus is starting to uh, discount, which is the risk of stagflation and the risk of an environment of poor growth and weakening of the uh, general environment uh, for most of the developed economies. And I think that that's why gold, which underperformed, because fundamentally gold underperformed in US dollars, but it massively outperformed equities and bonds and, and even some commodities in euros, yen or pounds. So gold has actually worked pretty well for investors in their local currency, except in the US, because the US dollar was the king of the uh, of, of the asset classes this year. And what I think is that we're, we're back to the carry trade we're back on on the on the carry trade mode uh, there's a lot of talk out there of central banks not being able or, or or even daring to really tighten and really uh implement uh, reductions of the balance sheet uh the uh, there's even talks of uh, some of the central banks starting to cut rates as from March. So therefore, that coincides with a very weak economy in general. And therefore, that would create some trading opportunities, at least short term for me, uh, for those asset classes that had underperformed, uh, at least relatively, uh, into the second half of the year. Yeah, indeed. Let me also just mention, you know, we are coming off of some interesting data that came out. So the U.S. Uh, manufacturing ISM, um, you know, coming in at 49. So now we're basically we're in a official contraction mode because we crossed under 50. It's the first time in uh, somewhere around two years or so. Uh, I will note uh, that although this 49 print did come in lower than you know expectations, which were 49.7. The expectation figures were also sub 50 in contraction already anyway, but nonetheless, um, yeah, lowest levels since uh, I think it's around maybe June or so or November 2020. I'm sorry? Since the, since the beginning of the pandemic. I think that this is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so. What is right. more, 
new orders part and employment part were also in contraction. No? Mm-hmm. Right, right. And and so the thing, the interesting thing that I want to note about that though is that you know because we did have PC numbers come out, we had some other data come out as well. But when you saw you know especially the the markets from the the currency side and the yield side move, it moved on the ISM print that came out more so than the others, suggesting that markets, at least, um, you know, the, the broader macro markets responding uh, to more so the growth side of things than they are really, you know, affected by these sort of inflationary uh, readings. Um, but, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like uh, the, we just had the broader kind of year zone inflation uh, come in below expectations at 10% yesterday. Expectations were like 10 and 10 and a half percent or so. And you have a euro rallying about 2% over the last few days. You have dollar yen dropping, um, you know, almost 3%. Um, so, you know, is, is this, do you think that this is sort of the, the a turning point, if you will, um, in, in these broader, broader markets? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a lasting trend, but obviously, uh, we've gone from a narrative of worsening inflation and uh, to a narrative of peak inflation. And I think that if you if you look at what uh, market participants are uh, seeing as bullish, well, think about this: a 10% inflation print in the euro area is atrocious. No, <laughs> and, and the and the, infl- and the core inflation number is is truly staggering. No, so. Uh, I think that it's basically that uh, market participants want to take some risk. They are seeing that the markets uh, reacted very aggressively and very quickly to rate hikes and to the weakening of uh, economic data. And uh, we're not going to see any change to that narrative, at least probably until uh, January, February, no? in which the base effect will probably change the narrative on, on, on or, or at least the perception on on persistent inflation. But so so I think that there's there's ample room to take some risk, to try to recover some losses, to uh, put bets on the underperforming assets that would fit with this idea of stagnating economy, persistent but not rising inflation, and central banks that uh, basically can't do much more than what they are doing right now uh, without creating a giant turmoil in markets and therefore a financial crisis. Okay, yeah, so very interesting. Um, So, you know, what I want to do today, uh, too, is that just generally speaking at you know the real vision daily briefing we i personally i don't think that we spend enough time talking about europe the eurozone and the ecb specifically um and the ecb certainly matters so it's a massive massively influential central bank um and i know you have a lot of insights on that um do you want to dive into the, the the ecb i know that you had some charts uh regarding you know the balance sheet as well as sort of you know global aggregate money supply um if you want to get into those yeah, if we think about the European Central Bank, I think it's pretty evident that it's been uh, going a lot slower in terms of tightening and in terms of uh, taking action against inflation than the Federal Reserve. It is way behind the curve, but it has gone very quickly from saying that they were not going to hike rates because inflation was temporary and was completely uh, because of the Ukraine invasion to hiking rates and confirming that they will continue to do so into 2023. So big change of tone from the ECB, from being massively behind the curve and even unwilling to admit the monetary aspect of inflation in the euro area to taking a much more uh, at least decisive uh, view on hiking rates. However, the big problem of the ECB is the size of the balance sheet. Uh, The ECB's balance sheet is about 67% of the GDP of the euro area, whilst in the case of the uh, Federal Reserve, it doesn't even get to 35, 37%. So uh, the, the first thing that we have to note is that the ECB has been a lot more aggressive in terms of asset purchases than the Federal Reserve has been, uh, to a point that 
even into 2022, the ECB was purchasing more than 100% of the net issuances of some of the sovereign uh, governments in the European Union. That certainly creates a massive problem of being unable to understand what is the real secondary market demand for sovereign bonds and what price uh, investors are going to accept. Because in the case of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has never been 100% of net issuances. And therefore, there was always some secondary market demand. Obviously, uh, the Federal Reserve does uh, depress bond yields. But in the case of the ECB, it was too used to the idea of purchasing everything and anything at any price. And uh, the balance, the, the, the ECB is in losses now, huh? obviously, because of the significant correction in the price of bonds. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for the ECB to do the quantitative tightening that uh, market participants expect from the Federal Reserve, because they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. If they do what the Federal Reserve is uh, has announced, it will it will do they will probably create a massive turmoil in the sovereign bond market particularly for peripheral countries if they don't do it then they have a bigger problem which is what we have seen so far this year is that the euro continues to weaken against the dollar that the euro uh, erodes its position as a as a likely reserve currency for many central banks uh, all over the world and therefore it's a very complicated situation they're expecting what the ecb is aiming to do is basically copy to a certain extent what the central bank of japan does which is to try to uh, do some yield curve control in this case it would be spread control mm -hmm. trying to avoid that uh, the spread between germany and italy the spread between germany and spain widens too much and creates uh, friction within the the euro area and i think that that's what they will probably do with this anti-fragmentation tool and try to reduce the balance sheet uh, slowly via the uh, unwinding of the uh, targeted liquidity uh, uh, operations, the TLTROs. No? And that is, it's, it's, it's obviously going to be a challenge because uh, the Federal Reserve always has one ace in their hand, which is that the US dollar is a world reserve currency. And that, uh, you know, when, when bond yields go up, it's a great opportunity for investors to take some, some treasuries. Uh, that does not happen in the euro area. When bond yields go up, people get scared. Sure, indeed. Um, so I'm to totally on board with you with this, and I kind of want to just drill into this uh, a, a little bit further here. Um, I just put out a real vision video yesterday um, addressing this same point. But you know what I was doing was I was talking about central banks when they're hiking rates and simultaneously they're doing QE. And I'm speak speaking of specifically the Bank of England from October of this year for two weeks, as well as the Bank of Korea. Uh, who is hiking rates and they're also supplying liquidity to the kind of front end uh, of the bond market and to, to the corporate uh, bond sector. Um, why do they do these things? So they're doing them. It's, it's this is the QE that they're doing, you know, especially in the Bank of England's case. It's not for the sake of stimulus. It's for the sake of stability, financial stability, because you have a ton of illiquidity and you have a spiral, a self-fulfilling kind of spiral of illiquidity and volatility in what's supposed to be kind of stable assets, long-term gilts, um, should not be having realized vol that's higher than Bitcoin uh, in pension funds, sitting in pension funds um, that are levered. Um, so what I was saying was that it actually might be sort of, um, uh, what might become sort of an expected normal thing for the process of removing, uh, you know, easing via the uh, reduction of the balance sheet or QT simultaneously with rate hikes because if you're going both in in one direction you're just going to create a ton of instability such that you're going to have to maybe come in like the bank of england did and do emergency measures and do a sort of you know a, a sudden emergency qe um and uh from what i'm hearing from you it sounds like the ecb is in a similar situation where they might find themselves hiking rates and potentially 
purchasing bonds of the same, you know, simultaneously as they fight inflation, but have to maintain financial stability in the immediate term. Is that correct? I, I would not disagree with that, because if you think about it, what the Bank of England has done literally is to try to put some water in it and to, to stop a fire, which was the massive unwinding of pension funds uh, problems and, and, and coming up with huge margin calls that would create uh, a very, very large financial hole in, uh, in the bond, both in the bond market, but also in numerous pension funds. So, so they basically have bailed out pension funds, to be fairly honest. Right. Um, in the case of the, of, of the ECB, it is not, not the same, but it is very similar. Is the ECB is perfectly uh, knowledgeable about the fact that if they don't step in the market continuously, the spread between uh, BTPs, the, the Italian bonds, and uh, Germany, and the spread between Spain and Germany is going to widen, and, but it's going to widen very quickly. And I think that that is what they worry the most, similar to the Bank of England, no? is that it's not just that those spreads may widen, is that if they widen, they may widen in a week. Uh, by 200, 250 basis points and bring the entire uh, bond structure from high yield to investment grade to a very uh, risky place. No, So, uh, yes, I think that it's very similar. Uh, the problem I see is the following, is in the case of the UK, it's a country that has a certain level of tolerance for inflation. I've lived in UK for decades, and, and, and it's very evident that citizens have a certain tolerance for inflation, inflation, uh, the, the inflation that we suffer in terms of cost of living is significantly higher than the CPI published by the Bank of England. However, I'm not entirely sure uh, that German citizens, Dutch citizens, are going to have the same level of tolerance for the extremely elevated levels of inflation that the Eurozone has. Right now, it is easy for the ECB to say that all of the problem is because of the war in Ukraine and gas prices and energy prices. Phenomenal. That is a good excuse. But the reality is that we've had larger spikes in natural gas or oil prices in the past with uh, inflationary pressures being significantly lower, actually being uh, three, four times lower. So uh, the monetary aspect is important, and the euro is not the world reserve currency. And more importantly, when we compare it with the Bank of England, the euro doesn't have the financial uh, the financial inflows that the UK has because of the city. So we have to. Uh, it's it's not a. I don't. <laughs> I don't envy the position of Miss Lagarde. To be fairly honest, Germans must be truly dissatisfied with the situation right now. And at the same time, uh, they don't know what they're going to do because if you look at the budget of the Italian government and you look at the budget of the Spanish government, both are uh, recklessly increasing deficits, looking at uh, debt as if it didn't matter. It reminds us a lot of, uh, of, of 2009, 2010. Right. Um, you know, because this actually, I'm going to bring in Fred Croft from YouTube as a question asking, is growth purely monetary? How should we be thinking about fiscal constraints? And I think you kind of touched on that right there uh, as well. Um, I actually, what I want to do is I want to play a clip because speaking of central banks um, <laughs> that may be behind the curve um, and may have to do some kind of different measures, but this is a clip from uh, three ideas, uh, which is basically three three trade ideas from Gio Chen. He's the uh, author of the Fidenza Macro blog uh, and hosted by Samuel Burke on the Essential Tier um, that came out today. So let's take a look at that clip. Um, He's been really steadfast in, in keeping this easy monetary policy. And, and maybe it's his intention to just keep that on until he leaves and not rock the boat. Um, but I think it's likely that whoever replaces him is going to have a fresh look at what needs to be done. And I think it, he may have almost no choice but to, but to tighten policy. And that means hiking... Um, lifting the, the yield cap 
on on JGBs, and eventually hiking hiking their base monetary rate. Okay, and again, so that was Gio Chen uh, on the essential tier that uh, you could see uh, today uh, with Samuel Burke from Three Ideas. Now, interesting sort of take there. Um, I will say that I've not only agree, but I've had this view in this trade of you know the yen short squeeze playing uh, playing. Yeah. But what he is saying, however, though, and I'm taking it from more so the U.S. yield, the U.S. to JGB yield spread. Uh, kind of, you know, col col not collapsing per se, but it's it's spread widening to set, have stopped and then to, to kind of, you know, pull in more together. But what he's looking at more so is that not as BOJ is the static central bank, but the bank that will have to respond to rising inflation in Japan, which is unlike what you were saying about, you know, uh, UK, highly intolerant of, of inflation, even a modest, you know, we have th three percent plus inflation here and space going to be you know the end of the world um and so it's it's from the the jgb side uh that he's playing a, a long end trade but what do you make of that and how, how japan fits into the equation of you know these are the, the majors you know the fed the ecb the bank of england um and the boj i would agree on the likelihood of a, of a yen short squeeze uh into the first two months of the year i wouldn't be long the yen from on a structural basis as a trade, I understand it because, uh, on the one hand, the, the the weakening of the economy, the challenges of the of persistent inflation have already been sort of discounted to a certain extent. Uh, trade growth weakening also is bad for Japan because obviously it's a big importer of U.S. dollars that that. Uh, fortifies the yen, um, so you you may have a short squeeze because of that of those things being already discounted. The problem I have with um, with a longer term view on the yen is uh, basically that the the central bank is not working for you uh, to to do to achieve that. Uh, now that inflation has risen to around three percent in Japan, uh, bringing it down to two percent requires more than just hiking rates, <clears throat> more than just hiking rates. And uh, so I'm afraid that just like what we discussed prior about the ECB, the Bank of Japan will basically make a few modest tweaks in terms of monetary policy with interest rates and basically allow the yen to be uh, weak because they cannot do anything else. Think about this. Uh, the Japanese economy, obviously, is a very, very strong economy in the sense that it brings a massive amount of reserves every year because of exports, no? But at the same time, it's the most indebted economy uh, in, the, in, the, in the Western world. And the, and the impact not just on the private sector, but also on the public sector is pretty is pretty high. So you know, I, if if I was if I was the the central bank governor in Japan, I would be thinking, okay, let let me think what I need to do. I need to hike rates and do quantitative tightening. I need to start uh, selling or uh, at least uh, putting pressure on uh, on the on the bonds that I don't want to. And that the sector and the private and the public sector will not tolerate it. So I would be, I understand the, the short term trade, makes sense to me, same, same as with the euro because of the already heavily discounted situation. But, but I don't see much, much, of a, much of an improvement into 2023 and 2024 because ultimately what we're seeing globally is currency debasement. What we're seeing is that. When having to choose between uh, very, very weak economies with even uh, very high levels of unemployment and uh, destruction of capital and therefore enterprises, uh, central banks uh, prefer currency debasement. And we're seeing currency debasement. And as long as we live in a currency uh, destruction uh, environment, uh, the dollar is simply strengthening 
on a relative basis. It's, you know, obviously the purchasing power of the dollar is not improving, but it's just strengthening because it's the, in a fire, it is the house with the largest number of windows and largest number of doors. So that's why people prefer the US dollar. But that's simply a relative trade, no? So I think that that relative trade is likely to, to, to continue after the short squeeze once the reality of the of the challenges of the global economy come back to bite uh, uh, into the first part of the of the of the year 2023. Right. So, um, you know, everyone uses the analogy of least dirty shirt in the laundry or whatever it is. Um, I, I I'm sick of hearing that. So I'm just going to use the term of uh, the skinniest kid at fat camp. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted to uh, talk about copper because you you showed um, you know this you, you sent us a chart of um, of copper. Can you can you get into copper and how uh, what you think it reflects? I think that uh, copper, aluminum have been reflecting how weak the global economy is and and as a bellwether of industrial activity, it's been very, very evident. Uh, that in a year in which we've talked about uh, supply chain disruptions, commodity strength, etc., aluminum, copper, iron ore, they reflected the weakness of the industrial sector globally, but also the weakness in China. No? Okay. And, and, that, and those two are not likely to get any, any better anytime soon. No? But also an interesting one with copper is the correlation with rate hikes. No? We have seen how uh, global money supply growth has been uh, coming down quite significantly after the rate hikes and how uh, many of these commodities have started to round trip very, very quickly. We saw that uh, oil prices, uh, even uh, freight rates, uh, uh, different commodities have round tripped from very high levels to uh, virtually virtually falling in the year on year. No? So I think that um, what copper is telling us is that the situation in China is worse than what uh, many of us probably discounted. And at the same time, that the weakening of the global manufacturing sector and coming back to the ISM that you just mentioned in the United States uh, is, is how staggering the number of uh, PMIs and, uh, and similar surveys are showing not just contraction, but contraction in the overall index, contraction in employment, contraction in the new orders uh, segment. So all of those show how how challenging the situation is for the global economy. And I don't see that it's getting any better into the first half of 2023. Yeah, indeed. Um, I just want to throw up a, a chart uh, of my own chart. Brian, if you just put up chart one. This is um, just a sample chart year to date of uh the Chinese yuan dollar dollar cnh so offshore inverted um and the chart of copper futures um and you can see that they uh do correlate uh pretty tightly when they correlate they took correlate really closely and they currently are and then the second chart i want to show was um so daniel you sent uh you sent over the top half of that chart that's basically global money supply um sort of you know m2 aggregate money supply and then what I added beneath that was exactly what you were just talking about. I just added a simple card of uh, a chart of um, cop copper prices, and yeah. you can see that they move basically price action wise. Copper rises alongside you know aggregate money supply and 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 falls you know uh, accordingly as well. Um, and so uh, it is both uh, a sort of indicator or a reflection of both kind of industrial activity as well as global sort of liquidity and and central bank um, you know accommodation. You bet. And also there's a very interesting factor about copper is that in uh, in China, uh, copper is used as, as a collateral for a lot of uh, high-risk uh, debt. No, uh, a lot of companies use uh, copper as a, 
as a collateral to get cheaper cost of uh, financing uh, against uh, uh, loans that would probably be much more expensive in, 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 in different uh, environments. No? So that's another interesting factor because it's showing that the uh, level of demand coming for aggregated levels of newly created debt is also coming down in the Asian giant, absolutely. Uh, indeed. So um, then we're at the kind of uh, the, top, the top of the hour <laughs> at the 30 minute mark. I was wondering if you have any sort of uh, last thoughts uh, to leave the audience with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, our audience basically knows that we have lived the year of reckoning. Now we have we are living literally the backlash of giant stimulus plans implemented between 2020 and 2021. Uh, those enormous stimulus plans generated virtually no multiplier effect, actually negative multiplier effect in some economies. And therefore, uh, what we are seeing right now is an environment in which central banks need to tighten, but at the same time, they cannot create a self-fulfilling prophecy of a financial crisis because of a credit crunch. So we need to live with that a different environment than what we probably would have expected in a, in a normal uh, process. We're not in Volcker period, is what I'm trying to get to. We are not going to see central banks uh, self, uh, you know, generating a, a massive uh, financial crisis uh, in order to just combat inflation. They will uh, live with persistent inflation. That's the message that they're providing. But obviously, when we look at markets and when we have seen the level of multiple expansion valuation uh, bubbles that we have seen in markets in the period of monetary expansion, we have to remember that a uh, end or at least a full discount of the rate hikes and the more, let's say, accommodative quantitative tightening is not enough for multiple expansion. For multiple expansion, we would need quantitative easing, and that is nowhere to be found in the next at least nine months uh, within the Federal Reserve, which, to be fairly honest, is the one that really matters. Right. Um, so just to sum things up, because uh, we covered a lot of stuff here today, but basically what you're saying is, you know, so there's some short-term trading opportunities, if you will, for uh, in reversals of, of some assets that have been just getting beaten down, the yen being one such, you know, short squeeze. Um, but broadly speaking, you're not optimistic on the global economy going, you know, forward f further out than just sort of a trading uh, opportunity on both the growth side and the sort of inflation mitigation side. Um, and to, you know, watch copper as a, a potential proxy for both industrial activity as well as, you know, aggregate money supply that has been going in a straight direction upwards for the last few years that has in 2022 uh, finally taken a pullback uh, with, with regards to the ECB, which is should never be an overlooked central bank. But the ECB has been, you know, rapidly hiking rates at its fastest pace, but is still way behind the curve. And what's more important th than rates with the ECB is the, the, the policy rate tool. More important than that is the balance sheet activity um, and what they do or don't do with that, whether it's yield spread control or, or what have you, um, and the illiquidity uh, that is the sort of headwinds that they're facing. But, you know, broadly, big picture, what we're seeing here is that ultimately, you know, this is currency disbasement that's, that's happening in global central banks. And since currencies are a relative game, that's ultimately dollar positive at the end of the day. Is that more or less correct? That was a, that was a great summary. Huh? That was a fantastic summary. <laughs> uh, the, the market will give us great trading opportunities for uh, oversold uh, trade and uh, to, to take short-term action, but let's not confuse short-term trading action with fundamental trends, because the fundamental trend is not, uh, is not one to, that allows us to look for valuation uplifts and massive multiple expansion as we saw in, in the past decade and a half. 
Fantastic wisdom. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks to all of you for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Uh, Andreas Stan will be back tomorrow uh, with Jim Carson. And I uh, wish everyone uh, good luck out there, particularly if you are a soccer team that's going to be facing Japan, apparently. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.